And we're back. I regret to admit that this is now a take two. Technically a take three because I checked again after take two and just to make sure. Um, I have failed my first podcast episode. I managed to set the loop brace on Ableton while I was checking uh, EQ levels on the mic. I had recorded like a 10 minute, 10 minute, 10 second uh, check vocal and left the loop brace on after I said the EQ, hit record and tabbed away while I was watching my notes and didn't think to go back and check until I was like 20 minutes in. Yeah, so it's okay. We're determined and we're gonna do this again. And to be honest, I probably needed a, a test round anyway just to gather my thoughts because I hadn't done this in a while. So there's that. Anyway. I'm going to try and say everything I said, but slightly more concisely because I didn't like the way that I was saying it before. And me saying that actually has made it less concise, which I find interesting and slightly paradoxical. So if you have guessed by now, the title is Perfect Strangers. I hope you read that. That would make sense, wouldn't it? You had to click on it. Uh, that's going to be the topic of today is going to be about a concept that I've been thinking about in the back of my head and trying to develop and wrap my words around for a long time and that I decided that I understood much better, more thoroughly after my recent trip to Arizona. So with that in mind, uh, I'll, I'm going to recap, I guess, the drive a little bit and some other things before I get started into that concept. If you're watching this and you're not someone who knows that I just moved, which I presume that the only people who watch this are close friends and maybe family. They're kind of doubtful that my family watches this. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Uh, definitely Dylan and Sean and probably Nate and some other people. I don't know who the other dozen people are. Somebody in Germany. I keep getting reading the analytics for old episodes and there's like somebody in Germany, which I think is funny. If you're the German person, reach out. I'd love to talk to you. Anyway. So I'm going to recap a little bit of the trip and just kind of talk about uh, the perfect stranger concept and some things that I did. So basically what happened was when I moved here uh, to Tucson to pursue a doctorate, which we're going to do a whole episode on that probably at some point, um, I took about 12 days to get here. I did the thing where I sold slash got rid of all my furniture and everything that's not uh, completely essential to my life. I threw out, I mean, I didn't bring any food. I didn't bring any cleaning products. I didn't bring anything uh, disposable or dispensable. Really what I brought was drums, clothes, not even all my clothes. I got rid of about half of my clothes, and then I still left another suitcase. And so it was, it was clothes, drums, books about drums, and that was pretty much it. I brought this desk and no other furniture. Not even a bed. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, that And my computer set up. So like my studio monitors and MIDI controller and interface and camera and microphones and audio gear and stuff. Sorry if that went through the mic. Uh, but that was it. Uh, everything that would fit in a Honda Pilot. And when I say fit in a Honda Pilot, I mean slammed to the gills full of stuff. It was pretty awesome. And then I did the long way. I just did the math on the first take of the podcast. It was about 2,300 miles all said and done, plus whatever driving around. So I think my rough estimate is about 2,500 miles from leaving the driveway to getting in the driveway. So where I went, uh, I stayed left out of on a Tuesday. And then I stayed a night in Pensacola, Florida, two nights in New Orleans, two nights in Austin, Texas, two nights in Lubbock, Texas, a night in Amarillo, Texas, one night in Albuquerque, New Mexico, one night, no, two nights in Flagstaff, Arizona, one night in Tempe, Arizona, and then got here on a Sunday a week and over a week and a half later. That was kind of the plan. I did not have a plan. And in fact, most days that I, I was on the road, I did not know where I was staying until the night or the day of, and there were some close calls too, where it was like I'm Airbnb-ing and 
people wanted a 24 hour notice and I'd get messages of like, Hey, cancel this. You didn't give me time. And I'm like, Oh, my bad. Oops. So I kind of learned my lesson once I got in a little bit. Okay. Maybe I should plan Airbnbs a day or two in advance, which I did normally, but it depended. Uh, the trip was just kind of getting amended as we went. So who knows? It was a lot of fun. Uh, briefly, I think I'll go over kind of what I did. I mean, I wanted to see lots of things. Um, if I'm going to drive it, I'm, I mean, I'm already, I think I added like four or 500 miles at least, um, on the trip because really I should have just taken 10 straight over, but going from Austin to Amarillo and then taking 40 and then going from Flagstaff to Tucson, uh, was a bunch of extra, uh, extra miles. And so I did that because for a couple reasons, I wanted to crash in Lubbock for a couple days uh, with a friend. That was the one place I didn't pay for, even though some places I paid extremely little money. Uh, I really wanted to see uh, Route 66 and some of the things on it, namely the Grand Canyon, um, Palo Duro, uh, some touristy things like Amarillo, you know, Albuquerque. I went through and, you know, just... I wanted to see those places. Also, I'm looking over and I realized that my stupid shtick of what I'm drinking. We're on Lava Panther today. It's a coffee day. It's a Sunday afternoon. We're loving it. So, anyway. Cheers to the coffee. The next one will be whiskey. <laughs> um, not now, but like the next podcast. Never mind. So, the long and short is Pensacola. I just kind of crashed there. Uh, hit a couple breweries. The brewery thing will be a, a mainstay. I think I hit like 17 on the way over. And some distilleries, which is pretty awesome. A couple breweries in Pensacola. I really just crashed a night there and then woke up and like went to the beach and saw it. That was it. There was nothing cool in Pensacola. Um, then, where did I go after that? New Orleans. So a couple days in New Orleans. I got to see the cathedral that I forgot the name of. Oops. It's, very, it's on the levee. It's awesome. Got to hang out at a couple awesome breweries, uh, especially NOLA, which was probably definitely top five, excuse me, top five for the trip. And is it definitely not top five ever that I've been to, but I've been to a lot of breweries, so that's kind of a tough one. Maybe top 10. Um, and then a couple other okay ones. Sorry, won't name any names. Uh, I got to see Bourbon Street. Some great food, Preservation Hall, the like Fourth Ward and jazz clubs. And I mean, New Orleans is just a sweet place to hang out, really. Um, there's, I mean, loads of music, loads of food, and loads of drunk people, which I was not that big of a fan of. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. That's an important point later. Not that, never mind. You'll see why. Um, and then straight from there to Austin, really Austin. It was a hangout, just kind of see Austin. I, I went to a comedy show there couple breweries, um, had Terry Black's barbecue. Awesome, right? Uh, Austin barbecue is like none other. So, uh, and just kind of saw some stuff. I got to hang out, listen to some cool music, some, some great stuff happening on sixth street. Um, it's beautiful out there. If you're driving around like the outside of town, I mean, it's green, it's rolling hills. It's amazing. A couple cool breweries. One thing that I did in Austin, actually, that I loved was I spent like a whole afternoon hanging out at Crowded Barrel, which is the whiskey um, company distillery that's attached to the Whiskey Tribe and the Whiskey Vault YouTube channels. Um, and then the Fang and Feather Tap Room is where I went, which is their their tap room location. And if you're uh, if you're familiar, I know I did not get to meet Rex and Daniel, but it was still kind of fun. There was a sommelier that worked there that was uh, like in heavy with the business and he, we talked and everything. It was awesome. I got to try their first actual grain to glass, um, distilled mix, which is a hundred percent barley, I believe 50% peated bar or malted barley, excuse me, peated barley. Ugh. Um, which is awesome. And I got to meet some really cool people. I got to meet a magnificent bastard. We talked about Texas alcohol laws, crazy stuff. So from there, go up to Amarillo, basically right after that, Hang out, uh, Palo Duro, hiking, amazing, it was awesome. Uh, there's some cool pictures I've got of hiking all the way down to the lighthouse in Palo Duro and then climbing 
kind of like up the lighthouse, which is probably ill-advised. And I was, if I had been six inches taller and really sure of myself, I would have climbed all the way to the top, but there was a, a hold. I just wasn't feeling really screwing myself up that day. Uh, but it was, it was aggressive. I got a little burned in Paladuro. Um, Cadillac Ranch, pretty cool. Head over to Albuquerque. Albuquerque is a sweet town. I had an awesome time in Albuquerque. Great people, great beer, great time. Um, Santa, oh, I missed some other ones too. Uh, I was going to try and go through these as I went. On the way to Amarillo, Sock Dolliger in Abilene. Uh, amazing. If I'm ever going back through the middle of Texas again, I'm stopping in Abilene without a doubt. Great beer. The flight handles were awesome. They weren't even handles; they were towers. Um, the the space was awesome. The staff was awesome. The Oktoberfest there has got to be insane. It was amazing. So go up. Amarillo's fine. In Albuquerque, Santa Fe Brewing. Moi, fantastic. So great beer, great people again. Great, just every every everything about the place where I went was amazing. So and then head over to Flagstaff from there. Um, Mother Road Brewing, amazing again. That was the only place where I think I bought actual merchandise other than like stickers, um, which none of the none of them have been good enough to put on the water bottle yet. The Sock Dolliger, I'm thinking about it. And I should have gotten one for Mother Road, but I did not. I meant to. Um, Mother Road was amazing. I went there. It was the only place I went like multiple times to a brewery. Uh, they were fantastic. The people were awesome. I got a glass fantastic and then from there the canyon and i got to go up to the grand canyon at at like 5 a.m in the morning and it was amazing i got to hike down i got my butt handed to me by the altitude naturally um it's not a thing that i'm used to but i would love to go back and i plan on going back now that i'm a little more used to altitude it's not high here in tucson but it's you know the difference in between 2,000 feet above sea level and 200 is a big difference you know in fact i would say that there's a bigger difference in between here and valdosta than there is here and flagstaff or here in the canyon actually so that was awesome um and that was kind of the thing i got to go after that i went down to tempe just crashed the night and went to a comedy show at tempe improv which was phenomenal again and that's kind of the high points um i, I saw a bunch of other cool stuff but Really, I just enjoyed, and I found this out as I was going, that I was less interested in touristing and seeing the important things as I was just kind of enjoying my time, like driving and talking. And, you know, the thing that I enjoyed the most was the perfect stranger concept, and that's how we got to here. Um, I said that all more concisely than I kind of expected. But the perfect stranger concept is something that I've thought about and understood a lot, but never really put a name to it and never really understood why, I think. But now that I have um, traveled, I mean, I'm not saying that I've traveled a lot. Like, I know all these people that travel a whole lot and that's their thing. Traveling's not always my thing. I love seeing stuff. I love meeting new people. I love going places, but I also love being a homebody. But I mean, it, when I'm putting this this experience, this 12-day experience in conjunction with the traveling I've done, you know, I've I've driven over the state every every summer, the, not this state, but the other state that I used to live in. <laughs> driven all over Georgia every summer doing band camps, right? When I put the trip to Arizona and that experience and when I went to Europe for three weeks when I was in high school and um, flying to when I went to Boston with my mom and trips to Virginia and trips down to Florida to see friends and you know just when I put those experiences together I realized that there's one kind of crux in the middle of all of it and it's like the what's the what's the fun part the the spirit of meeting people of meeting new people and everybody understands that concept like strangers are really cool especially if they're really nice and there's something about the human experience that speaks to that but the the more important concept to me has been understanding that 
the way that you interact with strangers kind of changes based on your proximity and your expectation of how much of a stranger they are. So when I'm thinking about meeting people in Valdosta, uh, it's not the same because you know, okay, I'm probably going to run into you again. If I ran into you one time, I should shake your hand and say hello and be cordial and do normal stuff. And of course, because that's you being a good human being, right? Now, this is going to get kind of weird and meta. So bear with me. Um, meeting someone in Tucson is a little different, especially depending on the circumstance in which I'm meeting them here because there's so much more people. The, the expanse is so much wider. I mean, it's not a huge city. It's not like walking down the street in New York where it's like pulling people out of a hat. You know, you actually do run into similar people in a lot of scenarios here, but. It's just a different, like the frequency of it is different by nature. And that's cool and interesting and exciting and uh, very strange if you're not used to that, like me. Um, but it's fine. I mean, I welcome the, the, I welcome it. It's a lot of fun, but it's just different. So uh, I've always kind of understood that being from a small town and moving places. I mean, I haven't moved nearly as much as everybody else, but it's kind of been... You know, every time I get a degree, I move somewhere else, and it's either an hour down the road or 30, <laughs> but, you know, it's fine. Um, the moving places may, has always made that make sense, but the concept now of moving, and in the middle of moving, I was in places where I'm likely to never be again. Like, will I ever be in Albuquerque again? You probably, yeah. Especially if I get the opportunity because I loved Albuquerque. I'd love to go back to Abilene. I thought that was cool. But I hung out in, I forget where I was. It was somewhere outside of Tempe. It was called Verity Brewing, I think. And I'll probably never go there again. The beer was good. The people were super nice. It was a great time. But I'll probably never go there again. There's a bunch of places I went through in Texas, just small towns. That, like, the odds of me ever being there again are, are slim. And there's a lot of places, in the, especially in the touristy parts, like in New Orleans, where I would meet a lot of people. And the odds of me being there again might be reasonable, but the odds of me seeing those people again are small. So like at the brewing company in Verity, which, and shout out, they were, that beer was awesome. They were a little hole-in-the-wall operation. I don't even remember where that was. I think it was outside of... Phoenix, I guess. I don't remember. I just remember it raining, like, massively. Um, you know, if I go back there, that bartender may be the same. I mean, she seemed to be part... I mean, it looked like it was like a family-owned thing. I mean, it's probably she probably will be there. And she was very nice. And But if I go back to this random, you know, bar watching a cover band in New Orleans everybody in that room will most likely be different, even the bar staff, you know, at that point. And even then, you know, come on. It's not like I ran into everybody. But with that said, some of those interactions are important. Um, and understanding the way that you treated those interactions based on your fundamental knowledge of I may or may not see this person ever again in my life is very important. Um, and then you also have to consider, and you do all this subconsciously. You make these considerations. You, you consider all the time, like, am I going to see this person again? But also, if I see this person again, will they remember me? Which is a completely other subject that's, that's very troublesome sometimes, especially when you're dealing with people in public. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. But anyway... Um, I, the reason for this whole perfect stranger thing was I wanted to take the time and talk about those interactions that I had because some of them were very important to me. And I, I think about them a lot now, even today and recently. I mean, this is a recent happening to me, but I think about them a lot. And I think about the way that I interacted with people and the way that I do interact with people a lot, partially because of this, because I want to make sure that maybe I'm delivering 
Sorry, my nose itches today for some reason, right right here in the middle of my mustache. Um, I want to make sure that I'm delivering the experience to these people that they are delivering to me and the experience that I'm delivering to other people the way they're delivering to me. And I want to make a couple things clear too. Um, in particular, the distinction between them. So I, I met a lot of good, especially with the breweries, um, I met a lot of good bartenders. Uh, fantastic ones, ones that talked and ones that gave great food suggestions and everything. And, uh, and one of the ones that stuck out to me the most was when I was at NOLA in New Orleans. New Orleans. Wow, just sure stumbled over those words. I'm going to take a, a small aside and something that I didn't mention in this take. Part of the reason it's taken me so long to do this podcast again has been um, just getting set up and figuring stuff out of here and getting school settled and trying to find a rhythm, um, which is understandable. Um, and another reason is, be, well, that's why it took me a little while. Another reason that I'm making a point to, to do it again, and I'm going to try and do it very regularly now, hopefully on Sunday afternoons, is because I'm noticing the more that I'm teaching now, I'm losing my voice much quicker. Even right now, I can tell that I'm losing my voice just from talking for uh, less than an hour. When I teach lectures, especially on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the day I teach them, after teaching an hour and 15-minute lecture and then running an ensemble with classes in between and talking and rehearsals and just interacting with people more talking, and especially with a mask on, you know, it's different than Zoom when you can just kind of talk to a camera, but with a mask on, you have to project more and, and enunciate Um I definitely feel my voice getting tired. So this is another way for me to practice and also work on the, you know, crippling social anxiety of living in a new place and not understanding uh, valuable social cues and friendships with new people that you're still kind of getting to learn and are in a different, like completely different aspect of life than you. But we all have that problem, right? Anyway, uh, so this one bartender in New Orleans and I asked her, you know, I was like, I just, just got to town. I came straight here. I don't know where I'm sleeping. Um, but do you have anywhere you recommend to go eat? And she took a coaster and wrote, like, everything. She's like, this is where the food is. If you want this kind of food, this kind of food, this kind of food, this is where the, the um, live music's at. Hang out here. And these are, these are the other good breweries. Go check these out. And which the brewery thing caught me off guard because, you know, it's kind of her job to be like, come back here every day and drink. And she was really like, if you want to, you know, if you're going to pass through and you want to try everything that's good, try these things. Like, you should. This is what you should do when you're in town. And I thought that was awesome. Um, and she took a long time to sit with me and write it down and ask questions. And that was fantastic. Um, and I met, I met plenty of great staff like that um, at, at, at breweries, but at restaurants and at the Airbnbs. I mean, I had a lot of Airbnbs. I had a couple of them that were like, I never saw the people. They were like, here's the door code. This is where your room is. Enjoy. But then I had a lot of people who I had fantastic Airbnbs with who sat and talked to me and offered me food and coffee and all kinds of stuff. Like in particular, the woman that I stayed with in Austin was, and I, I forgive me, I forgot the country and I feel like such a horrible, like extremely European person. But she was African and not African American, but like was a first generation from Africa person. Um, and she was telling me about where she was from and what she was doing here and answering all these kinds of questions. And she was very nice. And um, she was very, especially if she had a very thick accent, but she was enunciating very well. Um, and ve not to say that like, oh, you talk fantastically, but to say that she understood that in South Georgia, I don't deal with that a lot. And so she was trying her best to communicate very clearly to me and was very sweet about it. And I thought it was awesome. And she made hilarious jokes and she let me check in really late and gave me a special discount and had everything I could have asked for and was fantastic. And I had a great time. Um, and then I stayed with a, a nice young, uh, young um, gentleman in Flagstaff who was ex-military, who had no car. He had a bike and then he had this it was. It looked like I, he he explained what it was, and I I still to this day don't understand it. It was something like an all terrain buggy army vehicle from Sweden, 
that they only sold so many of, and he found a dude who had auctioned it, and so he bought it, and so that was like his main, if it's raining, mode of transportation. And it was like this, it looked like the the people moving tanks, like the, the, the I don't know the right words to use, but the military looking vehicles were, there would be tracks like a tank, but with tires, um, and like six of them, and, um, like a canvas top, you know, kind of like a back buggy thing. And it was like the, the four parking spot kind of vehicle. And he was like, yeah, I drive that to town if I need to, which was hilarious. <laughs> it was the funniest thing on the planet. I just asked him, I was like, is that your, and he was like, yeah, that thing. And I was like, yeah, I didn't know what word to use. And he's like, yeah, I get that a lot. And he explained the whole thing. He was awesome. He offered everything, and it, when I was out one night. Um, I told him, like, hey, I'm going to go find some food and maybe a drink or two. I don't know when I'll be home. And he goes, yeah, the door's going to be unlocked. And so I get back, and the door was locked. And so I was messaging him, like, hey, sorry. I know it's later maybe than is cool, but, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I got home at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was like I got home at, like, 1130 or something. Um, and it was because I wasn't paying attention to the time. I was listening to some good music and talking to some good people. But he he – graciously came to the door and was like, I'm so sorry. It must be the other person that's, that's here. She locked the door behind her. And I was ex expressly, a, I, he was, he was very cool with it. So that was fantastic. Um, and there was plenty of Airbnb stuff like that. And there's plenty of people that I met that were, that were awesome. And none of those count because the concept of the perfect stranger is importantly, someone who doesn't, have to interact with you to me um now that guy could have been like well i have rules sleep in your car you know or that lady in austin could have been like you can't request an airbnb and then show up 20 minutes later uh, which i didn't do she was like hey, can you give me like 45 minutes to go home and i was like yes no problem i'll give you as long as you want to get home i really just wanted a bed to stay in and if i can't until tomorrow night i'll sleep in my car that was kind of my other thing too was throughout the trip i made a conscious decision to uh, if it got to it, like, yeah, I'll sleep in my car, <laughs> which is bad. Don't do that. But you kind of have to be welcoming to the, the possibility of a less than ideal scenario to really enjoy the scenario, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, all those people could have said that, but they were nice in their interactions. But that doesn't mean that they were perfect strangers. It means that they were very nice strangers. Um, but they weren't necessarily strangers. You know, I... I know their names and well, I don't remember some of them, but they're on my phone. You know, I, I could message them right now. You know, I'd got their information. I paid them money. Um, it's, it's different when you meet someone and you, maybe you don't get their name or maybe all you get is their name and you don't get a phone number. Not that you're trying to hit on them or anything, but like you don't have any way to correspond with them in the future and you, don't have any reason that you need to talk to them or that they need to talk to you or there's no transactional stuff. Like one in particular, one guy uh, was at a, a Mediterranean restaurant in Albuquerque and he was selling me this sandwich. And I was obviously, cause it was, he was at a restaurant and I was buying the sandwich from the restaurant. I asked him like, what should I eat? And in a very thick Mediterranean accent, he explained that this was the best sandwich and that I should have it. And I said, okay, I'll have one of those. And he, you know, was like super nice. and like, let me know what you think and where you're going to be sitting. And I was like, I'll be sitting up here. And he's great. And I, I tipped him and I was like, I'd, I'd love to give you more money, but I don't have any more cash on me. I tipped him everything that was in my pocket at that moment. And he's like, no, you know what? He's super nice. And I mean, it's not like I tipped him poorly. I mean, I tipped him like 20%, but I was, I was, I, if I had had another $5 bill in my pocket, I would have put it in there because it's what he was doing. And I didn't realize till after I'd signed the thing. Because I was going to tip him cash. Anyway, it was not the point. Um, I, I tipped him off. Anyway. Uh, he came up and delivered me the sandwich. And I ate it. And when he got done, he when I got done, he was coming back by. And he stopped to talk to me and ask me questions. Or answer questions that I was asking. And he's like, yeah, that's great. And this is what's in the sauce. And, you know, I actually made that sandwich. And I'm like, oh, you made this one? And he's like, no, no, no. I made the recipe for that sandwich. That's my sandwich. It's like, that's amazing. So he's super great. He doesn't count either. Um, none of the Airbnb people count. The dude at the restaurant doesn't count. The dude, the bartenders, both male and female, don't count. The musicians that I listen to don't really count. Um, it's plenty of people, you know. They just, it just doesn't. 
It doesn't count. But I'm going to try not to make this that big of a deal. We're transitioning over to water. There were people that do count. Um, many of them, in fact. And, uh, well, about... I have a list. Three in particular. Specifically. And then there was a couple more every now and again. Um, there were just great interactions. Great stranger interactions. Like, in particular, some of the lesser ones. Not lesser, but... Less impactful ones was like, there was a couple girls at the Creek in the Cave. Well, women. I mean, there were, I don't know, in the 25 to 30 year range. They're like my age. Um, just saying girls seems weird. So there's a couple women um, that we I talked to. I sat at their table when I was at the comedy show in Austin. And we were shooting shit the whole time before the show. And they were very nice and awesome. And, I mean, we talked and answered questions about, like, being in Austin and comedy and um, the scene and who these people were and answer questions about the town. I mean, they were awesome. And then as soon as the show was over, I really had to go to the bathroom. So I up and ran for the bathroom and came back and they were gone. And uh, after that, I just, I don't remember their names. Uh, to this day, I don't remember their names. And I didn't remember their names right then. I've been watching comedy for an hour. I mean, it was, I just didn't remember their names. And But they were, they were awesome and they were very nice. And I would consider them probably perfect strangers. Like they were, they didn't ask for anything. They just gave information and talked very candidly and were great people. I just consider that good people. Um, and then I met lots of other people who were just, you know, along the way. Along the way. Um, that were very nice. But in particular, uh, I wrote down three that I thought were just above and beyond exceptional. Um, really like four or five. There's a, a nice couple in Flagstaff whose names, again, I do not remember. But they were asking me, well, we were at a brewery, and they were asking me questions, and it was later at night, and they were from California, and were just kind of like doing a little trip for the summer. Um, and it was a couple, and he was, it was funny because, you know another person who listens to these sometimes? Alex. <laughs> Which is hilarious because of what I'm about to say. Um, but Alex, if you're listening to this, I'd love to talk to you about this. I know I mentioned it to Bree. I might have mentioned it to you too. I don't remember. But they started talking to me, and it was like the California versions of my friends Bree and Alex. And it was the funniest thing because he was like a. I don't think it was insurance, but I think it was real estate. It was like something very, like not corporate-y, but still kind of like you know, private licensee kind of job, you know, where you're like, I'm an insurance person or like, I'm a realtor, you know, one of those things. And he was super chill about it, but he, he would not like stop talking about his job, which is fine because I was having a great time listening to it. But I just love watching people like Alex, who's passionate about what he does and just talks about it. It was amazing. Um, and she was very sweet and was talking to me about other things. And that it was it was just so much energy in the group of the three of us and then some other dude who kind of like came and sat down. Um, and they, they bought me like a beer or two and were asking questions and giving suggestions about the canyon. And they were super awesome. And I think I saw them the next day like downtown, but I didn't say anything because I was in a coffee shop and they walked by the window. But the odds of me ever seeing them again after that, mm, zero. And I don't remember their names. Sorry. I just call them California Bree and California Alex, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but they had the same kind of vibe, like vibe, like relationship -y vibe, but also just like person vibe as both of them. And I thought it was really cool. Um, but other than that, there was um, two other people in Flagstaff and one person in New Orleans. And I guess I'll just go front to back, I guess. So when I was in New Orleans, um, I was at this place. Uh, I'd come through it early. It's a bar. I'd come through it earlier that day on Bourbon Street when it was daylight, which <laughs> sounds dumb to say, and there was a cover band playing, and they were fine, and I was like, okay, whatever, I sat in for like five minutes, and said, big whoop, right, went and got some food, listened to some other music, um, left my debit card at one place, which is embarrassing, because as a bartender, I was like, I'll never do that, and then I did it, um, and it was just for dinner. Like, it wasn't like I was drunk at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was like I was eating dinner, and I left it in the leather thing. 
you know. And came back like 20 minutes later. I was like, I think I left my card. And they're like, yeah, oops. So it was very nice. They were very nice. That bartender was very nice. Um, but anyway, I came back to that place later that evening, and the cover band was still going. I mean, they played a long set that day. But when I came back, it was kind of packed and um, not packed, packed, but reasonably, like a 60% capacity kind of deal. And uh, I had a beer um, and was watching them and went over to have another beer because uh, they were doing awesome. They were, they were playing just, you know, just poppy covers or whatever. They were just great. It was a great show. Um, and I'm, I'm hanging out against this bar, going to get this, this um, get another beer. I was drinking, it was like a blue moon or something, just r- ridiculously standard. And I'm standing there watching them with kind of leaning on the bar, and I just feel a, a tap on my shoulder. And I turn around, and it's this sweet, you know, probably from, the, what, from what I can tell, like my age girl. And she's like, hey, what's, what's your name? And so I tell her my name, and... Um, I mean, it was, this was like a not, I wasn't l- looking in her direction. I didn't know she was near me. Um, I didn't, I didn't like bump into her or anything. Like it's just, she just tapped me on the shoulder and was like asking me uh, what my name was. And I was like, yeah, my name's Griffin. And you know, I'm just, you know, here traveling on the way to Arizona and to do this thing. And she was like, that's awesome. And her name was Margaret and. She was telling me what she did, and it was something not like vet techie, I think, but similar. It was I could hear by maybe sixty percent of the words she was saying. I mean, it was loud. I'm a drummer. I can't hear anything. Um, but she was very nice, and uh, you know, stood there. I mean, maybe it was maybe two minutes of talking, um, and then she paid for my beer. She did it like so fast, I didn't even understand. Like she, I was like, "Yeah, let me get a blue moon," and she was like, "Let me get a thing," and then his thing, and then the bartender turned away, and then I was standing there like, "Did I?" I didn't hear her say it, but did I make it up? Like, did she just buy my beer? And then the bartender comes back, hands it to me, takes her card, and walks away, and I'm kind of standing there, star struck, and I'm, you know, I, I kind of t- like we had been talking, and then about the time the drink came. We talked for a second, you know, another 30 seconds, 45 seconds or whatever. And then she goes, well, I need to, you know, I should go get back to my friends. She was hanging out like traveling with friends and was in town for a day or two, kind of similar to me, but she was going back where she actually came from. Um, And so I couldn't even, I didn't even have the time to say thank you for the beer and like, why did you buy me a drink? Um, And she just left. She didn't ask for a thank you. She didn't ask for anything other than my name and some questions and to say that that was awesome and like to wish me good luck and stuff. And I didn't know what to do. The bartender came back around. I was like, did she pay for this? She's like, yeah. And I was like, nobody's ever bought me a drink before, which is not true, but no stranger has ever bought me a drink. That's for sure. And especially nobody that I wasn't planning on interacting with in the future. You know, I've been places before, Especially with music, you know, you'll go hang out with people like at PASIC or something and, you know, let me buy you a drink. Yeah, sure. And then you're meeting this person for the first time or whatever or something. But this is like a person who said, let me buy you a drink. I just learned your name and I have no intention of ever speaking to you again. And that was all. And the the warm hug that you get from that experience is chilling. And that sounds really like backwards from what it should be, but it was amazing um because that i mean has that happened to me before that not that exact scenario but like yeah of course but not like that like it's it was a very strange scenario and it made me feel amazing it made me feel like maybe there's a little bit of value in just this interaction you know this random interaction maybe somebody can enjoy it maybe i have a little something to give as a conversationalist which not to say that i wake up every day and think that i'm a horrible conversationalist but it's not the first thing i think that i'm good at when i wake up i don't wake up and think man i can't wait to talk to somebody today and bless them with my voice i just don't think about that so it made me feel awesome 
And I looked for like 20 minutes. <laughs> she walked into a group of people and I never saw her again. And I wanted to say, thank you. Can I buy you a drink? Can I, can I, you know, can I, I don't know. There's a part of me that wanted to say, like, can, can I friend you on Facebook? Can I, can I do something? Like, I want to feel like a good person. You want to feel like, you know, even if it's, it doesn't matter who it is or what it is or anything. It, it, if it just, it's one of those scenarios where you, you kind of feel as if you owe someone a favor. Not even just uh, they bought you a drink, but just the, the feeling that they, they made you feel by showing you unconditional support for what you're doing. So for me going to school and moving, but also showing you unconditional support for just you as a human. Like I'd love to, I'd love to show you a kind gesture and move on immediately. You feel as a human as if you're being given something and you need to give something back. And it's, it's, un, it's impossible to not feel as if you need to give something back, surprisingly. And so I, I walked around to all the corners and I uh, tried to look. I, I looked and I couldn't find her again. I mean, for all I know, she walked out the door. But weirdly, I mean, she obviously just bought a drink. So she didn't just walk out the door, but she definitely disappeared immediately. I'll never see her again. But that's the best part. Like that was, That's why I wanted to talk about this is because this concept is infuriating, for one, and amazing. And it's not the first time that's happened to me and it wasn't the last time on this trip but it needs to be discussed because I feel like the the concept of never going to see you again person is something that we should all kind of strive like the way that I felt and the the way that she attempted to make me feel in a single interaction is something that we should attempt to make other people feel in interactions even even though we know we're going to see them and interact with them again it doesn't have to be it's almost like the um, the risk of it, the 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 weight of the scenario is gone because you you know it's a risk averse situation, and I feel like we all hold a little bit more water in those more common interactions with the people that we work with and see commonly that we don't treat them as risk averse situations and we don't allow ourselves to be free in that scenario and that's kind of a shame in a weird way. So I think we should just do it more. I don't know the right way to say this, but yeah, I think we should treat it more like that. And the second one, I'm going to try and get through these. The second one was a little bit less, you know, kind of important, but, or not important, but it's super interactive, I guess. But I talked to the dude for like 30 minutes at Mother Road Brewing about the Grand Canyon. And his name was Wes, and he was very nice. And I talked to him for probably 15 minutes before I, you know, I said, well, I'd love to go. And, you know, he's like, well, I've gone all the time. And I'm like, well, you must be a, you know, you must be really good at it. I, you know, and I know it's challenging to hike all that and it's big, and if you know all the, he seemed to know all of the the routes and everything. And I was like, "That's pretty sweet. You must live here." You know, he's like, "Yeah, I, I live here, and I work up there." And I'm like, "Cool. What do you do?" And he's like, "You're talking to a, a, a Grand Canyon guide. Like that's my job." And I didn't know that, but he had just kind of left that out. He's like, "Yeah, I hike it all the time." You know, not like, "Hey, I do this every day, multiple times a week. I hike ten miles down and up." And he told me his fastest time. He he's Good, good night is, is, he told me that he, his fastest time down and up, like to the bottom and then back up, which I think is nine miles if he was doing the, the bright trail or whatever it's called. Maybe it's six miles. Might be six miles. He told me he'd done it in like two hours or something, like one way, like two up, two down or something which is insanity. You've got to be booking it to do that. Is that right? 
It was some obscene number. If it's six miles down, I think it might be, I think he might have said two hours, which is insane. Just insane. Um, especially on the way up. I'll never understand how he did that on the way up. He did the way on, on the way up the same. I do remember that it was about the same time both ways, which is crazy. It's crazy. I got my butt whooped both ways, but really on the way up. I don't understand how anybody could do it the same. Either way, anyway. So he talked, he gave me he gave me great pointers on what to do, when to go, what trail to take, explained it all. I mean, and it was it was phenomenal. Phenomenal and he's a great dude and Yeah, I mean that was that was most of it. Is he's just a great guy. Um the third one was the more important one. Um I was at another it wasn't a brewery, it was a tap house in Flagstaff. It was the night before I went to the canyon. So that might have been the same day as I met this West guy. Um, and I was looking for music and walking around and found a little cover band and they were okay. And I sat down at this tap house and I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. I'm sure if I Googled it, I'd remember which one. There wasn't that many. Flagstaff isn't humongous. Um, and I sit down and this girl is talking to the bartender and I mean she's I think she was 26 27 something like that right around my age again and uh you know she was a regular obviously and so I asked her I was like you know what do you do and are you from here and she's like yeah I'd, um not necessarily but I, I got a job up here teaching a school and she was explaining that and pretty much well pretty much exactly the opposite of the Margaret thing I mean we didn't buy any Nobody bought anybody a drink, but she just talked to me for probably four hours. I don't know. It was something obscene. I was there at like eight or nine o'clock. Yeah, I guess it had to be like three hours at minimum. I think I got there at eight, eight thirty or nine, and I, we just started. To, I was like, "What do you do? What do you teach?" And you, she was asking me questions, and you know, she just teach and it was. She was great. Her name was Beth, and she she was just a, a a a lovely human being. I mean, there's not a better way to say it. I'm just like just a fantastic person. But the point is, I don't. I mean, I I think it, the reason that it was a problem was she was such a good conversationalist. Um, and I didn't even get her name. I didn't get her name until it's it's like time to for me to go and it was because I was talking and the band quit playing and I'm like oh okay that's great you know and we 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 talked and and <laughs> the band quit playing we kept talking and then I th had a thought I was like okay first I gotta go to the bathroom and whatever and should probably go after that or or something and I looked at my phone and I had that thought of like the band quit playing kind of early I looked at my phone and it was like midnight <laughs> I didn't realize because it was just, you know, I'd had, I wasn't like partying. I'd had like a beer or two. I'd been, you know, but I had just, we'd been talking so long that I had lost track of all time completely. I had nothing at all. I mean, it was just fantastic. And then I, you know, I was like, I'd probably go. I'm supposed to go hike the Grand Canyon at five o'clock in the morning. And she's like, yeah, me too. You know, I should go grade papers or whatever. And, and, you know, I think this was like a Saturday night. So, no, it couldn't have been. Had to have been Friday night. Friday night. So, she was like, yeah, I don't have school, but I should probably go grade some papers and whatever. Because I think they were doing summer work as well already. And whatever, whatever. But that was kind of like the opposite of the Margaret situation and, and the opposite of the, of the West situation. But the reason I bring up the three of those is... Because each one of them shows like a different aspect of, of what it takes to be a good person and a good stranger and a perfect conversationalist, right? You should seek to make other people feel good with random acts of kindness that are unnecessary. Like Margaret. And you should seek to offer information and expertise and wisdom to those around you that don't have it, who ask for it and who need it. Like Wes, who was like, you're not from here. Um, let me tell you how to hike the canyon and not die um, and where to go. 
And then you should seek to just have a genuine connection and a genuine interest in in people and and be like caught up in the moment, like I was with Beth, you know. And again, that's none of those people I didn't get their information or their you know I didn't follow them on social media and I didn't you know I don't know their last names. It's a miracle I remember their first names to be honest. And I don't really want to. I think that the the scenario is just better. If you just don't, you know, at the end of that day, I mean, I was like, oh my God, it's midnight. I should probably go hike the canyon in the morning, go get some sleep. And she's like, yeah, it's fine. And I was like, can I, I got to go this way. Like, can I walk you out? And she's like, yeah, great. Let's go. You know, so we walked out and I was like, thanks for the conversation. And I don't, you know, bye. It was basically what I said, you know, I didn't. And she's like, great, bye. It was nice to talk to you. And that was it. And it was the, the most wholesome, the most wholesome. And it really completed it for me of like, you know, acts of kindness, information, and true momentous conversation. Why everybody can't be like that and why every conversation and every, every stranger interaction can't be like that, I don't know. I don't know that it ever will, to be honest. Which is unfortunate, but is what it is, you know? Um, I don't know the way to fix that, and I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what to do about it. But I do know that it, it means a lot to me. And it I hope that it meant a lot to those people. And the thing that I thought about a lot was that those stood out to me. Those people stood out to me when I was traveling. And I really hope that sometime in the future or in the past that I stood out or will stand out to other people like that when they travel. Or when I meet them in person. Because we can have these kind of interactions in our hometowns or in the places where we live. We can have these interactions everywhere, really. And we should. And we should attempt to. And why we wouldn't, I, I don't know. But we can. And... I don't know what I have to do to kind of make that happen. I mean, I think about that a lot. But I think that we should all take a second whenever we get a, a chance to step back and, and think to ourselves, okay, what do I need to do to make these, these interactions important? And what do I need to do to make these interactions special to people and mean something? Because they always don't. They don't always. And... If you take the time to do that and to think about that, I think that you're actually on, on trajectory to change some lives. I mean, it changed my life. These people changed my life. No matter how you want to, no matter how you want to consider it, they changed my life for sure. And it's important to me. I don't know. I don't know a better way to say it except for it's important to me. And I hope that I'm important to somebody else. And I I stress hopefully to everybody out there who's listening to this to consider any time that you've done this and you know and and really heavily think about what what it means to you and what it what it means to other people and what you can do to mean more to other people. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how I do that. I have no clue, but on brand for me, I really like thinking about it. That's for sure. So I think that's mostly all I have to say on the subject. But I really just wanted to take a minute and kind of stress that and, and share share the experience. And really, I hope that other people, I hope that somebody can get something out of this. And I hope that, I hope that I can be better as well. And I hope that this is a, a good way for me to learn 
about myself and that it, it becomes a stay in, in my personality because I'm going to think about it forever. Even if I forget their names one day or I forget where I was at. I mean, if, even right now, I don't know that I could go find that bar in New Orleans. <laughs> you know, I could probably remember, I remember the places in Flagstaff. I remember one of them for sure, and I could definitely find the other one. But in New Orleans on Bourbon Street, I don't know. I'd have to walk in every one of them until I remember that really distinctive stage. But, you know, I don't know. Have to see. But even then, one day, I mean, maybe I forget them. I'll never forget the way I felt after that. Um, that's for sure. Anyway, that's all for today. Um, I can already feel my voice starting to crack a little bit. I probably sound awful just from talking so much. I'm telling you, I've been out of practice in the talking department. It's weird for me to say. But I hope somebody enjoys it. Um, I hope if somebody, well, obviously nobody minds because the internet is for me to upload random stuff that can suck. But hope at least one person kind of enjoys it and maybe gets a little bit of an introspective glance on it. Um, or coming back next week with some more interesting things, hopefully. Or maybe I'll just ramble, per usual. I mean, that's what I was doing today anyway, so... Um, enjoy, and I hope you have enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time. And that's it. I'm trying to not do the tagline. I thought about the tagline for a long time, and I'm not sure yet. I don't know. I haven't decided it yet. It seems cheesy, but it also seems not cheesy. I don't know. I'll think about it. We'll see. You can't get better unless you suck first, right? Oh, here. I forgot to do the other thing.